Uh, welcome um, to the library. Uh, and t Please hang be quiet. Yeah, shut up and and uh, and listen. Uh, we, we I am so uh, excited uh, to be here uh, today, and I really want to thank everyone for coming into this dark room on just an absolutely uh, beautiful day um, to meet these two uh, really remarkable people. Um, I'm just huge fans of of, of both of these um, authors. Uh, they've written um, each each put together. Um, uh, uh, respectively, uh, books that I think are just really a really important uh, looks at what exactly happened in Athens, Georgia, um, a few decades ago. Uh, I think uh, it's it's funny to me to talk a little bit about the history of Athens music because it was um, and the kind of music we're talking about. It started in the '70s because I, th I think it's so anti-nostalgia. Um, you know, you think about Pylon just racing headlong into the future and sort of leaving behind the past. And I think that's such a, a great piece of, um, of the, what now sort of ironically is this kind of tradition in Athens. Um, but I think these two works um, really transcend any idea um, of nostalgia and they're really worth your time. They're also for sale um, right out here. And I'm sure these guys would be happy to sign these books for you. Um, but they're great books um, to, to learn from and to, and to argue about. Um, I want to start off uh, introducing uh, Grace Hale, uh, who uh, I had talked to the first time. You, you may not remember this, but Grace is a historian and an American studies professor at the University of Virginia. Uh, she wrote a book that came to my attention as someone who's covering the South for the New York Times um, uh, that looked at the construction of white identity in the, in, in the racist South. Uh, it's called Making Whiteness, and it's a, it's a tremendous book, a very serious book. And I called her one day when I was on deadline, asked her a bunch of sort of fumbling questions as, as we were trying to get to the heart of some unpleasantness that was happening, that's, that's been happening in this country, uh, particularly uh, overtly in the last few years. And I think it was in that conversation, I was like, well, what are you doing next? And I was expecting something else along those lines. And she was like, oh, I'm doing a story of the history of the Athens music scene. And I, I thought, oh, wow, uh, this is, uh, I can't wait to see this. I was also kind of afraid for you, because I was like, <laughs> you know, and, and right? <laughs> like, um, you know, how, how, like, how does this serious, what is this serious historian going to do um, kind of interacting with and, and trying to describe a thing that was, in some ways very ephemeral and, and, and was you know, very much um, organic. It was, it was not something that came from the academy. It, I mean, it's something that was really like street, street level and it was, it was the kids you know, who put it together. Um, so it was, it was um, <laughs> it, 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 it's just a tremendous work. Um, and, and also Grace, um, because of COVID, hasn't had a chance to really do her book tour. So the fact that we have her here in Athens uh, today, uh, talking about her book is, um, is, is really uh, exciting to me. Um, Grace also uh, is a, a musician, former musician, um, and was here in the scene. Helped, recovering musician. Recovering musician. We call them recovering. Uh, helped run downstairs, if any of you guys remember uh, that, that great place, which is the, f yeah, which is like the, the first, when I first moved to Athens, I, I just kind of wandered into that place and saw this band called the Synthetic Flying Machine, my first night in town. There were like, you know, it was one of those classic moments, like they said, the first Sex Pistols show, there were like seven people there, and they're singing, we're in the movies, watching some people move their mouths, and a religious... And so, Will's here. Oh, oh. So, There's uh, Will. Oh my God. So, so anyway, that's, that's Grace, and then of course we have Henry Owings, who is just, I was thinking on the, on the way over here, I don't know how to describe you, I've known you for many, many years. I, I don't want you to describe <laughs> me. <laughs> but let, let me take a shot, if you guys don't know Henry, he is um, uh, uh, just uh, one of these people who I think is very crucial to, you know, if there is this idea that there, there is, there really is something like a scene, you know, a grand falloon maybe, you know, like it's kind of a fiction, you know, this idea that there's a, there is a scene. Um, Henry is one of these people who makes scenes work, and he's been doing that in Athens. He's, he's done it in Atlanta for many years. He's a show promoter. Uh, he's a phenomenal graphic designer. He was nominated for a, a Grammy. 
you know, Mr. Mister won a Grammy. You were just nominated, but for, for the <laughs> Captain Beefheart box set called called Grow Fins, which I think is just an amazing thing. Um, in, in, it's an amazing document. Um, he's uh, he's been dabbling in just this kind of bizarre, fascinating uh, painting, which we won't we, we won't we won't get into, I guess. Uh, and he's a, he's a show promoter. He's a publisher. He's a magazine publisher. He's a book publisher. And all, all this stuff has been like. This, oh, and I put out records and. I'm a stand-up comedian. He, like he's, he's, he's well, really... I, 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 like the only thing I'm going to say is, uh, first off, thank you for having us here, Athens Library. Thank you. Uh, but uh, Athens taught me to be this way. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, and, and it's it's credit to all my friends that I am yeah. doing what I do. It is not. It is not like I. I don't think of myself as anything peculiar. I am humbled to be standing here with everybody because it's like I mean yeah I've done a lot of stuff but a lot of my friends have done a lot of stuff you know yeah. it's like yeah it's like that's what we do well this 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 doing and making and you know to me like the the reason uh, one of the reasons why I, I was really excited to be a part of this is because you know college towns are ephemeral and changing by their nature I really feel like you know it's important to kind of look back and say okay this this important stuff happened here in Athens and I think for people who are kind of looking forward, um, particularly kids coming to school, uh, moving to town, um, it's important to see how it got put together, how people did it on their own without, you know, like, you know, corporations and all this kind of stuff putting it together. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a great uh, blueprint for, for whatever comes next. So it's really nice to see you again, Henry. So we're, what I was going to do is I was going to talk to Grace a little bit. And we're, the three of us are going to talk. Uh, we're going to talk about Cool Town, uh, her book, and uh, and then and then I'm going to kind of switch over to Henry, and we're going to talk about Plus One Athens, and to some extent Plus One Atlanta, which are these wonderful uh, compendia uh, show flyers, uh, me, show flyers from uh, from a, a series of years, and they're they're just remarkable to see them all uh, put together. Some of you guys may have actually been responsible for these these flyers, but they're a, they're a really great reminder that that all this stuff was was. And it was uh, it was musical, and it was kind of across um, media and across genres, which is really exciting. But Grace, I wanted to start with you. So you're you're writing um, about very thorny issues of uh, that, that have kind of bedeviled the South. Um, you you tell me, oh, I'm working this, on this book about the Athens Georgia music scene. How did you go from that place A to to place B? Well, there was a book in between those two uh, called A Nation of Outsiders, which was an examination of how Americans like to romanticize themselves as marginal uh, and often sort of in direct relation to how much they're not marginal marginalized. So um, there was a little bit of a stop along the way, and there were twins, uh, twin children in there. But, um, but, but mostly what happened was I got to the point in my career when I could do whatever I wanted. And um, it just seemed to me, I'm a, I'm a cultural historian, which means that most of my work focuses on cultural history, you know, narrative, storytelling, um, photography, film, that kind of thing. And it seemed to me that the most sort of, th the topic that was just calling out for somebody to write about it was a book about Athens. And I kept thinking someone else would do it and hoping why, wait, someone but, else would do it. But why? What was calling out to you? Because um, in the cultural history, the sort of understanding of the cultural history of the 20th century, um, there is still in the academic world such a kind of mistaken understanding of the South as a place where if there is any kind of creativity, it is in a genre that is imagined by others, and this is not what I think, but imagined by others as as untrained and rural and in some sort of relationship to folk. I mean, now they use all kinds of different words, untrained artists or outsider artists or Americana music, but it's imagined as not sort of having any kind of sort of conscious effort behind it or training or skill and... All the early 50s artists were from the South. Yeah, so at any rate, um, I, just, I just felt like it was a topic that, um, to understand, so in, in academia there was a lot of conversation about how cultural rebellion was over. There was no, it didn't do anything. There was nothing that it could do in the aftermath of hippies and then the rise of the, then they all turned into yuppies. And I know that's too simple, but that was kind of the dialogue and I just thought, 
you, you guys just don't know anything. You can't sort of proclaim the death of Bohemia standing in New York City. There's other places in the country. There's other places that things happen. So, so bizarrely enough, I didn't want, I wasn't trying to write an academic book, but the book was written out of my sort of anger at <laughs> my colleagues in academia and their understanding, if that makes sense. Well, it's, well, it's, it's interesting <laughs> to me like to think about this idea, this mythology of a kind of like a like you know, rural uh, cultural production. Years ago, I read this this piece that, that kind of pushed back against the the, the kind of the way the, the Delta Blues um, had been kind of extolled by white critics, white listeners. And I can't remember who wrote this piece. It was really nice, I and mean, it was kind of like yeah. There's also like Bobby Blue Bland, you know, who was you know very you know urbane, slick. Um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a different sound. It's a different feel. But this is. This is, you know, that other music is important, but you know, there's a there's a different, you know, there's a different there's a there's a different side to, to things. So, you also though tell us about your time in, in Athens because this obviously is not some exotic thing that you're going back to look at. You're going back to kind of uh, dig into something you actually uh, lived through. Yeah, I, I just will add one thing to sort of the academic motivation, just that in the cultural history of the country we don't know anything about this. That was important, but also, frankly, Vic Chestnut's death really came to me as a, you know, like, people aren't gonna be around to interview. And, you know, I know many people here, I'm sure, knew Vic, and people aren't gonna be here to talk to. You know, this just can't, like, somebody should do this, and somebody needs to get started, you know, yesterday, and so that, that was motivating as well. Did you, were you concerned that, I mean, you know, this, this wasn't a weighty enough topic. I didn't have to care about that because I had been promoted to full professor <laughs> for tenure. So that, to be honest, is the truth on that matter. <laughs> so, you know. Give them benefits. You no, know, but, I no. had benefits, so I could yeah. just do what I wanted. And you know, I think it's actually the sad truth about academia is that we have so much freedom and my colleagues I mean that broadly, in the broadest sense, across all of America, do so little with that freedom. <laughs> but that's yeah. just my critique of well, academia. I, I guess I meant more like, you know, were, were you concerned, like, you know, because on a good night, uh, when I lived in Athens, it was a bunch of kids like making noise, running around, having fun. I mean, obviously, I think it's a lot about a lot more than that. I think both, both of you guys would, would agree. But were you concerned that you know this wasn't about, you know, something uh, that, that it was there was something that was that was less than heavy uh, about it as, as a topic? Uh, well, to me it really was heavy because I think one of the things that I've spent my career as an academic thinking about is how, what is the connection between cultural and political change? How do we, how do we make deep transformation in the world? And it seemed to me that the Athens scene was just a giant generator of transformation in people's lives. So whether or not they, their band ever made it or they made music that anybody cared about, and to call me a musician is a stretch. I was very much, you know, I gave it a little bit of a shot there, but, um, but, but and, and, and loved every minute of it, but I'm just saying it just transformed people's lives is my experience. And, um, and I thought that that was a really weighty topic, if that makes sense, as we think about like, how can we make this region um, a better place, a more equitable place, a more just place, how people are transformed is something powerful to think about. Most people end up believing whatever their parents believed, but people came to Athens from suburbs, small towns, you know, suburbs of Atlanta, small towns all over Georgia and the rest of the South, and they were transformed in that process, and it wasn't just their musical taste. Um, they had, they, I feel like it gave people just a very different vision of what their lives should be or what, the, what, what it means to live a good life. And to me, that really was a weighty topic, so I felt like my task was to sort of explain why it was a weighty topic while also not losing people that would have loved to read the book anyway, if that makes sense. I'm not sure how well I did that, but I, I was trying to say, no, this is a weighty topic. No, I, I think it, I think it really it really comes through. I, I've told both of you guys that uh, I'm really awed as a reporter by both of these books because they're they're in tremendous reporting jobs. Um, just kind of like sp it's spine tingling. Like if if you you you've been an editor, like when you know somebody finds something, it's uh, from from reporting, you know as opposed to just like offering their opinion. It, to me, it's just, it's really exciting. It's like, you know, panning for gold and you've, you've, you've hit the mother load. And you, you like, and you, but it, it, 
it looks like it was a tremendous amount of work. Tell me, uh, tell all of us, like how you started out conceiving of the book, and then you how you went about researching it. Well, I just started trying to interview people, which was really complicated since I didn't live here and. It was just logistically hard, if that makes sense. Um, some of the people that are here I interviewed, and thanks to everyone who agreed to talk to me. Um, I really appreciated that. Um, that was sort of a, the first process, and then just coming to Athens and digging into, um, the, the library had almost nothing um, at that time. Now they've collected more, which is really terrific. And um, they've co collected some with, with your help, right, Henry? Yeah. Is that Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they're they're collecting now, and that's fantastic. I don't say this to criticize them, sure, sure. but when I started, which was way before the book came out, it took a long time. Um, they weren't, and so it was digging into just whatever kind of archival material. I even came to this. The, I don't remember if it was in this building, but the, the public library in Athens had some materials and um, digging into those like old fashioned like vertical files, you know, those kinds of things that the, um, the UGA library had and just, just anything I could find and talking to anybody I knew and asking them, you know, could they connect me to other people? Do they have any, um, you know, flyers, materials? I wish I'd met you. Um, and, uh, uh, and then the miracle of all miracles happened. Um, you know, I think I read every issue of the red and black for I don't know how many years and um, there's some actually pretty decent reporting in there back in the day I don't know how it is now um, and uh, uh, and then they digitized the flagpole which was like one of the I was telling Richard earlier I'm such a nerd I was like that was the greatest day ever when the flagpole <laughs> appeared digitized on the Georgia newspaper because you kind of figure archives. out all right this this was happening at this date yeah and yeah, well, yeah. the thing that's really difficult is you interview people and they remember the, the contours of their lives and the big events and the way everything felt, but they don't remember the chronology. You know, I'm a historian and I'm like obsessed with chronology. Or they and, get the address wrong. Well, they get the, they get the <laughs> dates wrong and I get the dates wrong in my own life. I don't mean this as a criticism, but, you know, I would be interviewing people and being like, well, you know, I was just reading the red and black from that, you know, week and I can tell you it was a Tuesday, not a Thursday. <laughs> so I hope I wasn't too obnoxious. But, um, but, but, you know, to get those kinds of things down, it was really, really important to have those newspapers. So the red and black and the, and the, um, and then old stuff like, uh, uh, what do you call it? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name of David, the David Pierce. Tasty World, sorry, having a moment there. Um, you know, digging, I used to, I was buying copies of that on eBay. They had a few at the uh, UGA library, but I actually need to donate mine to them because I found some they didn't have. How many in person, or I mean, just interviews did, do you think you did? I did about 70 interviews um, and a few repeats. You know, some people were so great that I had to go sign up for round two. <laughs> um, so, so that was really terrific. And I, at some point, uh, got connected with Christian Lopez over at UGA Libraries, and he was really great at helping with the logistics and then giving us like better quality recordings that we could archive. Um, so that was really fantastic. But it was a it was a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff. And one of the challenges of this book is that um, people are being asked about things that they generally weren't often often they weren't sober when they were happening. <laughs> and so so you know that was a challenge. I hadn't experienced that as a historian in the you know my past work as much. So that was a new that was a new challenge. Um, I, I, I'm going to just say because. <laughs> Uh, Will and Andrew are here. Uh, anytime the Elephant Six uh, documentarians come around, th they always say, go talk to Henry, because I was usually the most sober of the bunch. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I was recording and filming everything. So. so it's, you know, just that kind of process. And, you know, I, I'm a historian, so I generally work in a fairly chron chronological way. So um, I tried to sort of, you know, there were so many great bands that I didn't get to write about because... I was trying to write a book that regular folk could read and, and it not give it that kind of encyclopedic kind of feel. So I had to have sort of people that could be the characters that carried a chapter. So of course that would be Pylon, I see Vanessa back there, and you know, and, and other particularly important bands, but I didn't get to talk as much about every single band as I wanted because that is too big a cast of characters, sure. you know, my editor kept telling me. Yeah. So Well let me let me ask you this question. Um, you know, this is not the only college town in the South. I mean, I should say this is not the only place where these kind of really fascinating micro scenes popped up, Olympia, Washington, and uh, Minneapolis, um, you know, kind of places beyond New York, LA. Um, but this happened here more than it happened, I would argue, in 
Chapel Hill, with all due respect. It happened more than it, than it happened in Charlottesville, where you live. It happened more than it happened in Tuscaloosa, uh, Oxford, um, Baton Rouge. So why Columbia? So why did it, why did it happen here? Gainesville, so name them all. Yeah. Um, uh, so why, why, uh, why, why, why do you think it happened here? Well, I'll try to be short about this, and I think there's people in the audience that will probably have their own ideas. Um, you know, historians can talk about things for a very long period of time, so I'll try to keep it short. But, I mean, I think it's a combination of things, and then there's always that little bit of mystery, right? So the things that I think that are absolutely key, and some of them are fairly obvious, people talk all the time about it, how it was cheap, it was a low cost of living. Well, to that, I would say that it's really cheap in um, many of these other places you mentioned. So, so I don't think that's enough of a reason, although it's part of the reason. Obviously, the University of Georgia um, and the art school, as many would obviously know that that's important, but what surprised me doing my research was how much it was the fact that Georgia wasn't an elite institution, and I mean that as a compliment, and I, I know Georgia is an elite institution now, um, and I work at an institution that feels like it's the most elite, and so I, you know, I get a little tired of that. But, um, but my point about that is that it was open to all kinds of folks, um, in terms of income levels, in terms of like how good a student you were in high school. Maybe you didn't have your <laughs> in high school, but you could still get in back then. And I think that kind of, that kind of diversity, um, which, which you know, wasn't diverse enough in racial and ethnic terms, and I think that's, a, that's something I talk about in the book. But at the same time, that kind of diversity of life experience and income level, um, that was huge. And the fact that the university was really wide open. You know, I can understand, I have enough friends who are administrators, why the university isn't wide open now, but the way that students could use the facilities um, was really, uh, I think, just something that we don't think about enough. Like, everyone in town could use the library, go to, go to watch films in the library, listen to music in the library, look at the old bound volumes of the newspapers and magazines. You know, before the internet, that was, that was what you used. And, and the art studios were wide open. I mean, you know, uh, people, there was a guy that lived in one of the art studios. <laughs> he squatted there for years. I mean, you know, pe people, you know, there was a kind of openness to the facilities. I mean, maybe the, it's kind of like the adults weren't mind in the store, you know what I mean? But, <laughs> and I understand why, as a, as a person who works at a university, that we're not doing that now. But I think something's lost there. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, well, I, uh, <laughs> you, you are talking to like one of the greatest byproducts of scamming the university. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they like, were easy to scam. Thank you, University of Georgia. I worked for University of Georgia for four years. I think I worked, I'm going to say a good six weeks. Six of that weeks time. out of four years. <laughs> but I did I did chocolate. I used to put I used to design record. I, I did everything. It yeah. was it was like I was a kid in a candy store. Yeah. Well, well you know, go ahead. Oh I, oh, I just okay. If we want to talk more about that, I was going to go into something else. <laughs> no, I was one thing. So one. Two. Talk about ripping ripping off big institutions. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. So so, but I think they're like it, like I think about the the research triangle when I started really reporting there and really feeling the difference between. The two, two, two of the great institutions there, UNC and Duke. UNC is open to the to Chapel Hill. Duke is cloistered. You know, and I know Duke is trying to, to fix that to some extent, but but it's kind of like, yeah, this is why public universities are kind of amazing. You know, is because it's that permeable membrane. You know, your tax dollars pay for it, whether or not you go there. And it gets this gets into interesting kind of trespassing questions, like you know, this idea that you have. Um, this this real interplay between the the the, the university and, and the town, but I wanted I wanted to ask you before I forgot because you mentioned it, the Lamar Dodd School of Art. Yeah. I, one thing I didn't get to put in the review of your book because I just ran out of space was you you really I think rightly so um, focused on the art school as kind of the locus of of so much that, that happened here. Not everything, but it, is this real center? And I I thought a lot about all these interviews with British musicians that you hear, and they're like, well, you know, I was all just, just a total drug addict, and my mom said, oh, just go to, put them in the fuck, you know, yeah. they always say, you know? <laughs> and then that's, that's where all the great bands came from, it seems like, yeah. and I thought, but, but there's, there's, and you get into this to some extent, there's like a moment where the Lamar Dodd School of Art, I guess after the Second World War, the GI Bill's happening, in places, you know, far beyond, you know, New York City, 
like really interesting things are happening in American art schools. And can, can you just kind of talk about Lamar Dodd a little bit yeah. and, and how that all connects? Well, just to be clear, you know, all the people participating in the scene in the early days are talking about the art school and their art students, and that's important. So, you know, it's not like something I came up with, you know, it's something that the people who were doing it said. Um, but I did dig into the history of the art school, which I had not known. I'd known that all these folks were in art school and art majors that were creating these bands. Um, and that was really interesting that Lamar Dodd just had, you know, a great ambition. And um, again, I think this is, there's, I wouldn't like to work in a kind of atmosphere like this, but he had kind of dictatorial powers <laughs> over the art school as chairs of departments did uh, in schools. It wasn't, originally it wasn't a school, it was a department. Um, had in an earlier era in much of academia and he was very ambitious and he wanted to shake things up and to create, you know, experiment with new ways of teaching art and um, hire people uh, uh, who would shake things up. And, um, you know, they had that famous uh, sort of experimental uh, pro uh, art, uh, art in the dark pro project of teaching people to draw um, you know, the idea was, you know, sort of don't look at what you're doing, you know, close your eyes or it'll be dark, it's subliminal, do it quickly. Um, we should probably get Vanessa to tell us about this. I think she experienced some of this in art school. Some of this is from my interview with her. But, um, but, but they weren't afraid to, you know, it was a bold vision and, you know, some of this stuff probably in the end didn't end up working very well, but, but that bold spirit, uh, spirit of experimentation and some of the um, professors who just took a huge huge interest in their students and in uh, promoting that kind of sort of anti-expertise sort of sense, the idea that anyone can be an artist, all you need is uh, somebody to give you the right training, um, whether it was this weird art in the dark you know, program or something else, um, that it's not an elitist enterprise, it's something anyone can learn, and I think the specifics of that maybe don't matter so much, but the philosophy of that. Is, is what matters, if that makes sense, and was totally. spread really throughout the art school. Right, so I wanna talk next, if, if it's okay, about um, kind of the origins of, of the music scene as, as we, we think of it. And, but, and you also mentioned some characters that you had to choose. And I think of Jeremy Ayers, is that yeah. right? And, and Michael LaHusky, who I, I thought you really f focused in on there in, in a, for a big chunk of the book. Tell us about Jeremy, and um, who I just knew in passing when I lived here in the early 90s. Tell us about what he brought and kind of his role. Maybe talk a little bit about, it seems like, you know, of course there are other people who are working at the time, Limbo District and all that stuff, but, but the Bs you kind of focus on, the B-52s. Tell us a little bit about what, kind of how Jeremy Ayers ends up from being a Warhol superstar to being a guy in Athens and, and what that, kind of what he brought to this. Yeah, when I lived in Athens, I knew Jeremy, and I didn't know anything about his history. And at least in my experience, he would never talk about the past. I mean, others may have had other experiences of Jeremy, but he was such a, you know, I, so much of his kind of presence was to live in the moment, in the present. And, and so I didn't know this whole history of Jeremy until, um, until I started digging into it, and when I reached out to him several times to try to interview him, he said, "No, I don't. I don't like to talk about things in the past. You know, I'd be happy to see you. You know, happy to talk about what I'm doing now. You know." Um, and then, unfortunately, um, of course, uh, we lost him too. But um, I'm glad you brought up Jeremy because the other main source of the scene that I didn't get to talk about that I wanted to was just the you know gay queer culture in Athens, which was fairly closeted in, but not totally, um, you know, it, from this post-war period, um, a lot of people connected to the art school. Um, I heard several several people reported that Lamar Dodd was, was, was something of a don't ask, don't tell kind of person, but not, but not, but not as people went at the time, particularly homophobic. Um, I think people today forget how much homophobia there was in America, although perhaps, you know, we are seeing something of a resurgence in that. Um, but uh, that is a huge, huge place that the scene comes from. And Jeremy Ayers is a great way to talk about that. So his dad was, some of you probably know this history, his dad was a professor um, of religion and a chaplain, you know, UGA chaplain. The family moved here for that reason and he grew up here. And then as people did who wanted to be artists or to have a bohemian life, he went to New York where he, uh, got involved with um, the drag scene there and um, during the time when Warhol was uh, interested in the drag, the drag scene and the drag queens, uh, Jeremy Ayers was one of those folks. Uh, the, his drag name 
was silver thin. There's wonderful pictures floating around on the internet you can find of they're that. They're just phenomenal. Yeah, they're phenomenal <laughs> pictures. They're phenomenal pictures. Um, but Jeremy um, was friends with from two younger guys in Athens that he was friends with and really something of a kind of mentor, older kind of brother figure to Keith Strickland and Ricky Wilson. And just when I found out that story, which I did not know when I lived in Athens about him being you know, in the factory and Ricky and... Keith going up to visit him in New York on the bus because Keith's you know parents ran the bus station. I mean that just that just I don't know. See, this is why I'm a historian. You can't make that stuff up. That is gold. That is just amazing story. So, um, so I think that one of the things that 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 is interesting about Athens is how much there is thought and connection and you know, understanding of what's going on other places go, going on here. And these folks, you know, they, they would go and hang out with Jeremy and the drag queens, and some of the drag queens would come to Athens and visit them. Um, um, Holly Woodlawn, I think, came to Athens. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the exact people who came, but some of the famous drag queens came and visited here. And when Warhol kind of moved on to the, you know, rich folks set, um, Jeremy moved back to town. Um, and he just brought that spirit with him, and Keith and Ricky and Jeremy and a whole collection of their friends were just sort of in many ways turning Athens into a theater of their burlesque kind of drag, kind of avant-garde show, just right out there in the streets. The, the um, this... In the 70s. So, so but Jeremy, like, like in, in, and this, this kind of fits in the kind of Warhol factory star model, um, is, I mean, he's... He's an artist in so far as his his life could be a work of art, right? This is me misquoting the Minutemen thing, but like, yeah. that, I mean, when I met him here, I didn't know what he did, but like he he was around, and you could tell that this he was very much integral to this 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 place, and and it's it, it's it seems like that's a, that's a part of what has made Athens Athens as well, not just the people getting up on stage and playing music, but this whole group of people who were kind of involved in this kind of artistic expression, even if it was just like the way one lived one's life, I guess? Absolutely, and you know, Jeremy Mint, Minter sounds too like academic, but you know, he was friends with and influenced so many people, so many different people, you know, people like Michael Stipe, um, people that formed Chickasaw Mud Puppies, uh, Brant Slay and Ben Reynolds, I mean, you know, round after round, Victor, you know, he just influenced, like, you know, every time you sort of dig into something, there's Jeremy Ayer somewhere connected. Grace, um, I, I only want to interject. I, I'm, I think I was one of the first people to buy your book, so it, it's like, that's why I, I really want to hear you talk. But I just want to say, like, how I, your book was the first to nail Jerry's involvement in the Athens music scene. He was always mentioned, but his importance was never really claimed because Jerry never cared. You get, I mean, it's like, which I think it, it speaks to what a great guy he was always. But that, that it's, it's just, it, it's funny because he would never care. He, he'd be like, yeah, whatever. I mean, but it's just, that was kind of what they ushered in is this, sort of like, you know, democratizing of talent. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, <laughs> speaking only from when I got here, you yeah. know, it's like, I mean, the, the, the people who went on to be the geniuses of Athens were, you know, maybe at best working at the grit. Yeah, well, well when I knew Jeremy a little bit, that's how I felt about him, but I, you know, I really tried not to trust my own memories in this book because I interviewed so many people and I realized how much as I said earlier, we weren't always sober and people's memories are what they are, right? And so I always tried to corroborate even my own memories with other people, with other sources. And so it, I felt that way about Jeremy, but then, you know, everybody I interviewed that ever knew him said that. So it was, you know, really the only way to describe him. I just... So, you know, the, the South, um, I was born in, in 1970 and, and the, this idea of Southernness that I grew up with was, you know, Southern, Southern culture. Um, you know, obviously is, is influenced by this tremendous African-American tradition, some of it rural, some of it urban, but it, it all being, not all, but, but to some extent at that point, it's being filtered through kind of like a white consciousness, white gatekeepers, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then you had the 70s where in rock music you had in the South, like the, 
the Molly Hatchets and the Allman Brothers, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. Where it's 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 music. It's a lot of white people playing uh, in a in a black idiom um, of, of a certain kind and it's a, of a certain time. Uh, I was, you know, I was just, we have the, the, the guy who produced uh, Athens, Georgia, Inside Out <laughs> with us today, which is amazing. Seeing that, seeing that movie in 1986 and seeing all these kids who didn't look like Molly Hatchett, who didn't sound like, you know, Leonard Skinner was just absolutely revelatory to that me. That movie changed my life. It was my, mine too. It was, it was just, it was just remarkable. And, and you could feel that, you know, and that was, and I was reminded uh, today that this is 86, right? But like this idea of, of something new being born, which we with downtown New York, with London, with maybe a couple, a year or so behind Los Angeles, but it really seriously happened in, in, in Los Angeles. It's, it's happening all over, but, but in a way, there's like some really ground floor, like avant-garde thinking happening here. I mean, the B-52s show, I mean, this, I can't believe, why, why, why we don't have Vanessa up here, I have no idea. But this yeah, idea, well, let's this make idea it that, the, 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 this idea, yeah, come on, like the come idea, on, the Vanessa, idea that pylon us. goes up, come on. Like, like, goes we up don't to, want Vanessa to be uncomfortable. Yeah, I mean, if she would like to join oh us, my gosh. we would like to like, have her. So, <laughs> yay! So, you come over here, Vanessa. Yeah, I can't jump up on the stage anymore. Buddha's a bop! <laughs> so, I, while she's walking up, I'm going to say, when I was in high school, I used to write pylon. <laughs> And uh, it wasn't until I sat down with Pylon to put out a record with them that uh, she saw my fan club card. And she said, yeah, that's my handwriting. And I was like, yeah, I'm a freak. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> Fawcett, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. Vanessa I, Hay, ladies and yeah, gentlemen. From, yeah. from Pylon. So, so, I used to actually go to, go to Kinko's like on a made-up excuse just to see if I could get her to help me with a coffee machine. <laughs> I was legitimately starstruck when I would see Vanessa in town. Oh, I'm legitimately I'm starstruck. I still so, am. So, Vanessa, here's a, here's a question for you, if, if I may. So, like, it, in, in my mind, it's almost mythic. Like, you guys go up to New York and everybody loses it. Like, you're more Gang of Four than the Gang of Four. They write about you, they eat dub for breakfast, you end up writing a song about it because you're like, I don't even know what you guys are talking about, right? I think that's like, but, but, you're, but you're like, you guys are coming out of Athens in the late 70s and you're, you, as I mentioned before, it seems like you're pushing way into the future. Where is that coming from? What was your mindset at the time? What, do you, what are the building blocks for this? Because this really is something new. Well, oh. um, Here, come take this one. Here, I'll figure it out. Mine works. This works. Maybe I'm just not talking loud enough. There it is. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, I came to Athens in 1973 and came to the University of Georgia Art Department because it wasn't a school at the time. And I was 17 years old. And... Um, I'd have to say that the art school completely broadened my horizons. Um, where, where, was, where are you from? I'm from Decula, which is between here and Atlanta. I only ever applied to one school. I come from a um, um, background. My mother worked, you know, like uh, she was a nurse's aide, I guess they call it now, but she worked in the nursery at Gwinnett. And then she went to the sewing plant because my dad didn't like her working at night. My dad worked uh, as a loom fixer at a cotton mill. And so I'm from a very blue collar background. I was probably, other than someone studying uh, to be a minister or to be a school teacher, I was the first person in my family to actually study the yards. But my parents recognized early on that I was a little different. They encouraged me by taking me to the library every week and that type of thing. And um, they, they allowed me to go to art school. You know, it was hard for them, but it was the only school I ever applied to go to. So I really felt like the town I was from, like I had been dropped by aliens or something. <laughs> 
there was nobody I had anything in common with other than maybe one or two other people. Like I had a girlfriend who liked science fiction like I did, and she ended up going to Georgia Tech. <laughs> so I came here to the university, and it was just like, it was mind-blowing. And uh, um, I had some great professors. Lamar Dodd had actually retired, I believe, the year before. And the year before that, that had a huge political uprising or something where they'd gotten rid of quite a few faculty members. And uh, it was always pretty political. Um, but I didn't know anything of that at the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I had like Jim Herbert um, for drawing, and uh, I had uh, Judith McWillie. Uh, for um, my color theory class, and uh, and then Bob Croker was the one that you're talking about, about the professors. He threw it all in with the students. He actually knew his days were numbered, and he said, this last year, which was my last year of school, I'm going to throw it all in. I'm going to teach this the way that I really want to teach. He totally immersed himself with us, instead of holding himself apart, like, you know, I guess professors are supposed to do, he'd have Less part. and more collaborative. Yeah, yeah, and so I had independent study with him, and that's where I met Michael LaHusky, and then later on, Randy Beely, who was his roommate. And the way I met Michael LaHusky is we had a, a critique, one of the first classes with Croker, and uh, he has some uh, his beautiful drawings on the floor. I don't know if you've ever seen them, but they're very expressive. And um, you know, he's always used the same size of paper and beautiful handwriting over, over them. And uh, there were some footprints on the edge, and there were two students over there going, "Well, I think that this drawing would be more dynamic." if the footprint was over here, you know, it would really help the composition. And I walked over behind him and I said, how can a footprint be in the wrong place? <laughs> and Michael's head just snapped up. <laughs> and he came over and he started talking to me and he was like one of the coolest kids ever at the art department. So we became very good buddies after that and started hanging out. And then I met you know, his roommate, Randy, one night, we were at the Waffle House after, you know, critique would be, you know, Wednesday nights, we'd have it, we'd look at everybody's stuff. We had a couple of grad students in this class, too. And then we would go and have the cheapest beer we could find. We would find, like, where the dollar pitchers were. We might end up at Allen's. And then we might go over to episode, was it called 241? go dancing, and then we would go to the Waffle House and have breakfast. Well, I ended up sitting next to Randy for some reason, and he was really impressed that I could get breakfast and leave a tip for a dollar. <laughs> and so <laughs> we became buddies, too, after that. So, but, you know, the thing about being in Crocker's class, it really expanded my horizons. Uh, it, um, you can't say, he wouldn't say that he taught us to see outside the box, but he taught us that there was possibility of doing that. And that uh, also, we took that over and, you know, to art, like you were saying earlier, it was like you didn't have to be schooled in that, but uh, you could have the, uh, um, you could have the idea, you could have the mindset. If you were an artist and you decided you could do it, then you could make that, like Michael won the sculpture contest at the London House. He wasn't a sculptor, but he took a sprinkler hose and wrapped it all the way around one of those big light posts in front. <laughs> and he won. And, <laughs> and the real sculptors were so mad <laughs> that like the next year, they made it so you had to be invited to enter the sculpture contest. <laughs> And so he wasn't, you know, invited the next year, but... You know, Vanessa. I mean, you know, these are the people I hang out with. And so, you know, when they were... Uh, Randy had the idea to put this band together because um, 
the B-52s, when they got big, they just took off like a meteor, you know, going across the sky. It was just like amazing and very fast. And um, they moved to New York because at that time, people didn't stay in places like Athens or Atlanta even to promote their music, to have a career. You either went to New York or Los Angeles. I mean, and if you were country, I guess you went to Nashville. But the, yeah, or, well, I don't know about that. But yeah, well, I mean, that's much later on. But you know, back in the 70s, I know. And so there was this vacuum created here in town and Randy had the idea that he would uh, form a band. And uh, he talked to Michael about it. Michael was like, no, no, it's already been all been done. It's too late. <laughs> and uh, 79. this is 1978. 78. Yeah. yeah. And so first they tried. So happy. I know. <laughs> Randy was on drums, and then Michael, he picked bass because it only had four strings, so he figured it was easier. And I thought, <laughs> and so that wasn't working out. They couldn't really write like that. I mean, method act actors were much later, so uh, Randy switched over to guitar. They had pawn shop uh, instruments, then Curtis heard them practicing over and over from upstairs where the studio was, and then uh, um, came down and knocked on the door and was like, do you need a drummer? You know, because <laughs> he was, you know, they were ready for one. So they, they got him, and then after a little while of practicing, they uh, uh, tried out, I think, about three men, and uh, none of them worked out for whatever reason. One of them, they told me, is he brought a guitar and he had ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they didn't want to, you know, they wanted to start off from the same place. And so um, Randy one day said, well, what about Vanessa? She's a good friend of ours. You know, they like the way I look. They didn't know if I could, you know, sing or not. And I had only ever sung in the chorus in high school, which is not like this. So they invited me to audition. <laughs> and I auditioned, and they didn't say anything. They said, well, we'll call you. <laughs> and, and then the next day, I got a phone call. You're in, and this is the idea behind it. We're going to go to New York, get written up in New York Rocker, and then disband. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's not going to take too much time out of my life. <laughs> so. I said, okay, you know, because I understood the premise behind that, that it's if it's an art project, you have a, a goal, you know, like if you're a painter, a sculptor, or a performance artist, you have an idea, you make it happen, and then you have your show or, or non-show or whatever it is, and then the project's over. So that's all I thought it was ever gonna be. So I was really kind of surprised. You know, what? So, w w tell us about your first show. How? Where was it? What were the circumstances, and how was it received? Who was the audience? Well, we were uh, above Chapter Three Records, uh, downtown Athens. They previously had an art show up there, and um, these two guys who ran Chapter Three, John Underwood and Chris Rasmussen, um, who you might know or might not know, but the that record store was very important to the creation of a scene here in Athens. Why, why is that? What was it like? They had a lot of uh, imports and they had a lot of uh, underground records that you wouldn't find at, say, Turtles, which was another big record store at the time. I don't know who they talked to or where they got this stuff, but you could go in there and it was very close to the art school. It was right across from um, the arches, and uh, I don't know what's there now. That's where the Starbucks is. Like, no, it yeah. was ne it was next to there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a little. I, I'm just trying to like vicinity of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, 
you know, that's like, uh, at that point in time, you could own everything that was new music that was coming out at the time because it was something that was different. They weren't calling it new wave. Um, before that, there was punk, you know, like the Ramones and that kind of thing. But you could go in there and, you know, own everything. They had German singles. They had British singles, which singles is still my favorite format. And records, and you could talk to people. You know, we bought a copy of PIL Metal Box there as an example. But um, anyway, upstairs it was like, at that point in time, like most of the places, it was just like a pigeon roost, as I can say <laughs> about it, because these pigeons would get in and there was pigeon peep everywhere, which I know is toxic now. They were like, yeah, you can use this for an art show, but you've got to clean it up up here. So they came in and cleaned it up and had an art show. And uh, I auditioned February 14th, 1979, and I think March 9th, 1979, uh, we had our first show, which was not even three weeks later, <laughs> above this place. And I mean, you know, Michael and Randy had rigged it up. You know, we had projections that said our names. and different things, and they had some neon, and it was very dark. You can go to the Brown Media Center, and there's a Super 8 movie that's about a minute and a half long that shows a little bit of it. You can barely see it. And uh, the Tone Tones also played. And uh, then our second, sh oh, and you wanted to know what the audience was like. They just stood there and stared at us. <laughs> They're like, what the heck is this? You know, this isn't the B-52s. This isn't rock and roll. This, somebody said it was like a jet aircraft that got turned on or something. And <laughs> they didn't know what to make out of us. And then the second time we played uh, at Curtis's Loft, uh, which he dubbed the 40-watt club because it was lit by one 40-watt bulb, which was... Uh, Upstairs uh, in the Myers building above, uh, I don't know, Schlotsky's was there and then uh, some hamburger place and same thing happened there. <laughs> and then the third or fourth time we played at this house out in the country where there had been an art exhibit called the Brick House and the B-52s had been out of town and they heard us and they you know, they came and they saw us and they immediately started dancing and they were the catalyst. Everybody started dancing. The wind was coming in and out of the room like uh, wind rushing out of a speaker box. And uh, Kate and Fred came up to us afterwards and they were like, you've got to come to New York. We will help you get there. Fourth and show. Hmm? After your fourth show. There might have been another one that I've forgotten. I, you know? I, 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 it's, I, it's just like sort of the trajectory that I think a lot of, because I, I try and tell people all this kind of stuff, and it's like, you're in Athens, Georgia, going to New York, like that's, that's, that's an ordeal. We didn't know. Yeah, you didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. It was fun. It was an adventure, right? And so... Uh, and you were tourists. Yeah, we were tourists in the land of rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... <laughs> Then, um, you know, uh, F uh, Fred had a friend who was the doorman at the Mud Club. Y'all have probably heard of the, about that place. And he knew everybody. So he took our tape around, which we'd made on a Kmart brand cas cassette, on one of those black oblong cassette players that has the <laughs> buttons you push. And he got us booked with Ruth Polsky at Hurrah. Now, she didn't last but a few more weeks, I think, and then Jim Farratt took over, and he was calling Michael. Well, how about opening for so-and-so? And, -so? and Michael was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and I mean, who the heck are we, you know? We're like nobody to be turning down, opening up for some band we don't like in New York at some big club. But he was like, no, I don't think so. And... Uh, about the third or fourth time, they said, uh, well, the Gang and Four are coming. How about opening for them? You know, they were probably ready to give up on us by that point. And Michael was like, yeah, 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 yeah. We love them. We had that single. And so, you know, in August, um, 
we had that gig, and then on the basis of that gig, uh, Vic Varney was a friend of ours. He called around some places, and uh, he said, hey, this band is opening, you know, from Athens, Georgia, is opening for the Gang of Four in New York. Would you like to book them? So he got us two other dates, including opening for the Gang of Four in Philadelphia. But that's a really long story. <laughs> Well, this um, you mentioned a couple things, and, and I want I want to throw them to our historian for a minute because I think they're really interesting. One of them is the importance of this record store. What was it called again? Chapter, Chapter three. So, you know, for most of us in this audience are you know uh, not digital natives. We remember what it was like to have to go buy a product. Maybe you didn't know what it sounded like, um, but it was it, you know you, you had to find the place that had the stuff. Now um, you can find you know, whatever you want everywhere, all the time, on your phone, from anywhere in the world. And so I wanted to ask you, Grace, a little bit about how this all ties into kind of why you feel Athens and kind of the, the, the model of Athens is important, whether it's important in the 21st century. You, know, you had this kind of like, you know, these micro scenes that are built around the fact that Maybe there's a, there's a chapter three records in your town, maybe there's not. If, if you think you're into that stuff, and this is a big story around Georgia and the South, but your town doesn't have it, if you know, Young Harris doesn't have it, then you gotta go to Athens for it, you gotta go to Atlanta for it. If Takula doesn't have it, you gotta go to Athens for it. Um, that's really not a thing anymore. Um, so thinking about, you know, and, and the way regional scenes grew up, you know, it seems like they're kind of fertilized by the fact that, you know, well, there's this guy down the street who sounds like this, and I do or I don't want to sound like him. And you have some sense of what's happening nationally and interna internationally. But now kids have access to everything. They can sound like anything. Um, it, what is the, it, it, is it worth talking about like whether or not what happened here um, is, is, is valid as we think about like modes of producing culture in, the, in, a, in a time when the world is just a lot flatter? Well, I mean, obviously, I think it's valid since I spent many, many years working on a book about it and writing a book about it. But And also, I'm an old person, so I remember pre-digital pre days. But I do think the thing that the easy answer to that is that politics isn't digital. Politics is about precincts. It's about territories. It's about, you know, this ter you know, gerrymandering is about dividing up the land. It's about dividing up the space. And I, I just think that alternative culture was an incredibly transformative uh, thing across America. In some ways, the opposite of the kind of sorting that happens now where, oh, you're interesting. Well, you know, move to Athens or Charlottesville or Asheville, or maybe you'll move to Austin, although I do think that's over now, that, those horrible, you know, as soon as Tesla went there, right, it was over. But <laughs> anyway, we, could, we can argue that one. But, um, but, but it's the opposite of what happens now, is that people, people are not moving somewhere so much as they're trying to make where they are different. And I actually, I, and I love the digital world. I mean, I was just up here extolling the incredible wonders of digital archives, right? And how excited I was about the flagpole and red and black being digitized. So it's not a bad thing, but, 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 the, but there's a materiality to politics and and to life that has to happen in the place that you're at. And the how are we going to transform those spaces and not be such a polarized country? And I know this is a little maybe far from music, but to me, alternative culture is a model of how that can be done. I mean, it's not the only model. There's other models. But how places can be transformed that are, that are physical places um, and the other thing that I will say is that it is actually easier to create without knowing every single thing that's ever been done in the world that's great. So I do think in some ways the internet is bad for our creativity because in a place like Athens where these bands are trying not to sound like each other, um, there's such a kind of diversity of sound, especially in the first you know, that late 70s through late 80s period, there's, you know, oh my gosh, you can't sound like REM. I mean, that's just like horrible. You can't sound like Pylon. You've got to figure out what your own sound is. And not knowing every great band that's ever existed, not having, you know, having some of them at the record store, some quirky selection of music at the record store, but not everything that's ever been done, that's actually kind of better. 
Uh, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it helps you to think you can yeah. do it. You know, it's that sense of like, what is possible? What can I do? Well, a quick observation, and then I want to, Vanessa, don't forget, I want to ask you about kind of how Pylon sort of conceived of itself in terms of your southernness. But before I do, the thing when, when I lived here that I thought was so amazing is whoever those other seven people were in the downstairs, um, you know, it, by the time I got here, so many people had come because of the music you'd made. Uh, they, they were musicians themselves. Or there were people like me who were non-musicians who were just really interested in whatever that was happening here. That a, a lot of people um, in this town had just such a very high level of knowledge about rock and roll and pop music. And like, you could just feel, you know, in the back of a room sometimes, you know, I was saying this to Henry the other day, like, you know, there's like six people in the back going, yeah, 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 second Richard and Linda Thompson album. We get it, come on, let's move through, you know? Yeah. Well, like, it's just, it, it was, it, it, which made it really hard, but it also made it really interesting that here's this, you know, you, you think about, I don't know if Paris was like this in the 1920s or whatever, but here are all these people who come from all these war-torn countries who come from, you know, who, who all have this, this interest. Uh, and it's, it's this community of very intense interest. And it's not always pretty, right? I mean, there's like, going to be sniping, this, that, and the other. But it's, it's, to me, that was one of the things that just made the town so interesting, is that there, you know, the, everyone, not everyone, but, but there's such a lo relatively large group of people in this small town, you know, kind of out of the way, that had just really, really deep, deep knowledge of everything. I mean, you think about Ort and Kurt Wood, and, but I mean, I mean, all these people are just walking kind of encyclopedias of this stuff. And so yeah, you're of them are here. Yeah, so you're like Buck, too. Pete Buck, yeah. Pete Buck. So like you're you're playing for your you're playing to your peers and your peers really, really know their sh to me to be uh, to must be have been very daunting, but also like really, really exhilarating that like you're playing to, to that crew. But, but but tell me a little bit because you know it seems like they're very roughly you can have these these two kind of buckets. You have the bucket of, and I don't think this is just Athens, I think this is a lot of rock and roll um, that was happening, that's been happening in the last few decades. You know, are you gonna say, okay, I'm gonna acknowledge the blues, for example, maybe as the example, and I'm gonna work off the blues. Um, or, you know, I'm gonna decide that 1976 or 1977 is year zero, much like Pol Pot, and I'm, everything else vanishes and I'm gonna start right here and I'm gonna kick against it and I'm gonna, I'm, the rejection of it is going to be the, the is gonna be the thing. And, and I think Pylon fits, you know, in an Athens context, fits in the latter category, where maybe like the Chickasaw Mud Puppies were more kind of tr trying to kind of like, you know, give some version of, of, of the past. You guys seem to be like, no, 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 we're, we're, we're just forging ahead. How does that connect to, or is this a dumb question, but how does this connect to the fact that you're from Dakula. You're from you're from Georgia. Um, that you guys were a southern band in a way. Well, I think that uh, what you're saying is uh, all valid, um, but I don't think we ever saw ourselves as just purely a southern band. But just the fact that we're from the south is just part of the background of what we were. But also, maybe being in a smaller town, we had more freedom, like you're saying, uh, to be creative. There are a lot of things that happened. Um, uh, it was the group of people that were here at the time. Um, you have to have a certain number of people to make a scene happen. And I think we had that right group of people at the right group, you know, at the right point in time to create a tipping point. You know, you've read that book. Or make any kind of scene or movement, you have to have a certain number of people. And so at that point in time, everybody, there were not that many bands to see. There were not that many places to go. So when something did happen, that whole group would show up. They would be there. And so, you know, uh, we were approaching it as artists not from the standpoint of being musicians. It was just like another tool, like having paint brushes, you know, if you were a painter, can of spray paint or whatever. Um, and, you know, we, we all like uh, played off of each other, you know, like they come up with riff, go over and over, and I find a place to fit in there, like Curtis would find a place to fit. It was like being inside of a machine, a cock that was inside of a machine. 
And it's real difficult to describe. I think the other day I did an interview and uh, with somebody and um, I was trying to explain it. Sometimes when you're really lucky, they call it being in the zone now. Um, and you really feel like you're part of everything at once. You really feel connected um, to the music and what's going on. And it's kind of an addictive feeling, you know? <laughs> we, we saw, uh, my family and I saw Rosalia on Monday in, um, at the Coca-Cola Roxy. And th this idea of being in the zone, which you know, so many people in the sports world use as well. I, I was just watching her, this, this person who's like in this, she's kind of like David Bowie in 1972. She's just firing on all cylinders. Every, like, the, it's dance, it's kind of like a literary sense of the world, it's pop music, it's, it's rock and roll, it's, it's punk, it's like, it's just visual, it's, it's everything. And, I was, and she was just on for two hours, and I was like, this is kind of like watching Kobe Bryant. You know, I mean, it's just, it, it's the zone, you know, she's just, she's just in it. I wanna ask um, uh, a, a, one more question of, of Grace in particular, um, and then I wanna throw it to Henry, so we can talk about this, uh, this great um, kind of visual expression that Pylon was a huge part of. Um, uh, just what it looked like to walk outside and see flyers uh, in this town um, back in the day. But, but this is, um, to me, a really important question in Georgia, which um, is, is now um, undergoing uh, quite, or has been undergoing quite the um, transformation politically. And a lot of that has to do with you know, demography being destiny, um, that there uh, it is a more multi-ethnic state than it was. Um, <laughs> to some extent, the hindrances to, to voting for, for people of color, uh, I think, have fallen away, although we can have a very long conversation about whether those restrictions are being put back in place again. But yeah. so, so, but as, as all this stuff has been happening in Georgia, and we've really seen it politically in the last few years, um, you know, all that stuff, I think, is of preeminent importance. Um, this scene, you, I think you, one of the things I absolutely adore about your book is you actually get at this and all the subtleties of it. You know, there was, I remember reading interviews with REM, I think in Cream in the Reagan era, and them saying, uh, they're like, well, what about the clash? And they're like, yeah, just look, look, we're just trying to make records, you know? Um, that there, and I think you actually have a Mike Mills interview where he's kind of saying, politics is not our lane right now. Of course, that changes really radically for REM quite, just a, a few years later. But, but can you talk about, I mean, was what happened here part of, of the, what we're seeing now, this kind of, this changing um, way that, that, that uh, Georgia works politically? Well, I think it is. I mean, the demographics are obviously really important, but there, there is a long history of white allies for the project of racial equality and greater democracy in the South. And I do think one of the things that was interesting about the scene is the way that it transformed people who, whatever their parents' politics were, or maybe they weren't very political at all, um, but participation in the scene over time politics became a part of it. And it wasn't, I don't think, so much a part of it, although Vanessa can speak to this from the start, because I think there was very much a sense of we're making art and that's kind of over here. But one of the things I think people forget is how much during um, the Reagan era and the rise of the new right, in Athens, the new right was like right in your face because it was, the mayor was a, went to the Prince Avenue Baptist Church and they were tearing down every old house they could buy. Um, and we all lived in those old houses. And so it was, you know, sort of thinking like politics isn't our thing wasn't possible, if that makes sense, in a way that um, I think transformed a lot of people. And maybe that was a kind of selfish, like, this is happening to me directly, so I'm going to care. But it had bigger ramifications than that. So if it started out like we're going to fight, and the church wants to shut down the bars early, and the church doesn't want to, you know, the, the New Right doesn't want us to carry alcohol around town, unless it's a football game, and then it's OK. Anyway, so those kinds of things were like visceral, like that you could, it was affecting your life as somebody who wanted to go hear music or play music or be an artist and live in town. And people got politicized by that. And the guys in REM got, you know, they lived here and they also traveled. They were, they have talked about being politicized by their travels and hearing people in Europe talk about Reagan and how horrible he was and how that kind of 
helped them to sort of have a different vision. But, for, but I wanted to write about how just what was happening at the grassroots level on the ground was changing how people felt. And Athens always had a lot of liberal professors, but it didn't have a, it didn't have a liberal government. It had a very conservative city government um, for a very long time, until the late 80s when Gwen Aluni first became mayor. So, so the scene was a really big part of that. And there's that famous t-shirt, I actually still have mine, that Gwen Aluni, one of the people she was running against said, oh, you know, she's the one who's got all the, the blacks, feminists, do you remember this t-shirt? The blacks, feminists, hippies, and gays, I think it was, or something, you know, that she's, she's brought in all those people. And Gwen, of course, turned it into a t-shirt, which was brilliant, right? And, and then she won. And, it, and the old, old Athens establishment did not know what hit them. And, you know, REM was like, you know, given money, you know, they were, you know, well enough off by that time. Burtis Downs gave money, you know, people that had, you know, more than the $5 that, you know, we could have given, you know, were given, you know, maybe $1,000. And Gwen, nobody saw it coming. And, but, but I think people forget that these college towns, though there were always liberal professors, did not, they weren't, they weren't liberal in their politics. Like, like now we have a sense like college towns, they're almost always blue, right? But that wasn't the case. And so anyway, so I think that's no, a part of the story. Uh, this, yeah, I mean, th just thinking as you were talking, like when, when uh, I think when, when Michael Stipe came out of the closet, I think that was actually a really seismic event. Yeah. But for gay rights, like that, that I don't think it was really talked about very much. I mean, his influence um, you know, at the time, they're, they're, you know, they're still sort of like, you know, they're, they're not Michael Jackson, you know, they're, they're not, I mean, they, they're kind of on their way there. But uh, it was, a, I think it was a really huge moment for a lot of people. And I think this kind of idea of like personal politics um, was, you know, if, if, you know, my sense of your book was, and, and I don't think you're very, very, very wrong about this, in fact, I think you're quite right, is that you showed how this was a scene that where, you know, women are leading in, in a lot of cases. And um, gay and lesbian people are also very, very right. much driving the scene. They're, yeah. they're sort of, you kind of look back and you go, yeah, that's, that's, that's happening here. That's, that's hugely important. But I think you, you rightly gave Athens less of a passing grade on race issues. And if we could talk about that briefly, because I think that's really fascinating. It's thorny, but I think I'm really glad you wrote about it with such uh, nuance. But, but tell us about kind of the way okay. you synthesize it. Uh, very briefly, I'll say, I should have said also homophobia was something politicizing people because during the AIDS epidemic and the way that Reagan was responding to that, that was also something very visceral on the ground in Athens because people were gay and they were queer and we didn't want our friends to suffer that kind of you know, discrimination. So that was part of the politicization too. But, um, but I don't, you know, I think that, that one of the things that's interesting about being a historian is what counts as um, an anti-racist or interventionist or one kind of politics in one era is not necessarily in another. And people work with the materials they have at hand. And we live in a time where we sort of wanna like have one lens and judge everybody. And I think that's kind of problematic. So I tried to talk about how the Athens scene very much had an anti-racist politics, but the, also the limits of that politics. Like the limits of a mostly white scenes and in, in ability to imagine what would make the place more welcoming or more a place that people of all races and ethnicities would want to participate. And you know, I think we now have a very well developed kind of critique of colorblindness, but at the time when you're living in a world where the frat boys are using the N word and where, you know, people have this kind of open visceral racism, people in the scene have have a kind of anti-racism that is about like, we don't recognize race, we don't see race, and it's formed in relation to that very public, open, white supremacy that's very much come back lately, hasn't it? But at any rate, um, but that I think created a kind of politics of colorblindness that we can now critique, if that makes sense, and say, you know, that's really not, like, like, you can't just wish race away. You can't just say, I don't see race, or I, I'm not racism. You know, racism isn't just about your individual feelings. It's much more about structures of power um, and histories. Um, and I think we failed there. I mean, I don't think we had the tools. I don't think we had the imagination, and we didn't have enough people of color in the scene. There, there were some people, for sure, but it was a mostly white scene. And we didn't think about like what would draw this, I mean, Athens has a long historic black community. 
you know, people would go see black music, um, but those folks wouldn't come into, for the most part, back in that day, into the 40 Watt, right? And what would have made that different? So I think that's worth talking about, you know, in a way that I'm trying to, to be sensitive to, if that makes sense, but, you know, in academia, I get criticized for not being critical enough about the racial politics of alternative culture. So, but I, I'm wondering if in this crowd, I might not be critiqued well, I, I for think that. that um, <laughs> and and to, sorry to be a little bit pluggy here, but like if you haven't read this book and if you've spent any time in this town, uh, um, you know, I've always been kind of a bit of a tourist in Athens, but I just felt like it was, the, thing, the things you wrote were, were really, um, really well observed, um, worth, worth wrestling with with. If you don't mind, let's turn to Henry and this amazing uh, book, uh, Plus One Athens. Uh, so, so, so Henry, um, much as, as I mentioned, um, as somebody who has to go dig stuff up for a, a living, um, you are a digger. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm sure. Why not? I, I just uh, mine uh, I, I want to know, first of all, how you got the idea to do a, he, uh, Henry's done two books now, one called Plus One Athens, uh, one called Plus One Atlanta. The Atlanta book is, I think, in some ways even more revelatory than the Athens one because, you know, in, until like the, the current moment where, you know, we have a trap music scene, um, you know, and there's, there's now been like really good writing about this. In fact, my colleague Joe Coscarelli has a great book out, um, just came out this, this week uh, called Rap Capital about, that kind of gives a really good sense of how Atlanta became, became the hip hop capital of, of the universe. But Atlanta, you know, before, you know, the rise of future Migos, et cetera, you know, it, I don't know if it really had coalesced as a scene in people's minds. Well, I, the, the thing that I wanted to get to the bottom of, and I'm gonna try not to yell into this microphone too loudly, uh, is I, I got, <laughs> I was neurotic in that when I moved to Athens, my knowledge was already pretty good. And once I moved here, my knowledge strengthened. Um, and when I started, you know, it's like I, I had a, a, a little presentation um, that I forgot to put on a jump drive. Um, so instead I'm gonna, it, what, what I really wanna do is kind of like explain how I got to this point because I think it is something, I, like I have d personally digitized 16,000 pieces in a year. Myself, Henry Owings. 16,000 flyers basically. 16,000 pieces of memorabilia, like done by a professional. Like it, it's not been phoned in, it's not like, it's not a Facebook group, it's none of that. It, it's like I'm doing the work. And what I, what I realized in very short order is, you know, and, and a lot of it is because of my work on the pylon box, I was like, I could not. So, so um, this, is, this is me in 1989. Uh, 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 like, uh, 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 Pylon opened the show, and my girlfriend, I asked her to take a photo of me in front of it. She didn't get the Pylon part, but she got REM. That was in Roanoke. I drove down just to see Pylon. Um, but th like I was a huge, 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 huge fan of Pylon and I could not believe that I was getting to see them. So I drove all the way to Roanoke from York, Pennsylvania. Well, that was like a seven hour drive. Go to the next one, Steph. Oh yeah, that, that's me. Eh, you don't wanna see that. Uh, so I worked with Pylon. Um, on the left, you'll see uh, a live record that I did with them about, about a decade ago. Um, but it started my, my, my very, uh, very appreciated role in their career. Um, I was able to design, I was one of the producers on the pylon box. That, I designed that billboard. We surprised Michael Lahusky and the band with it. They where didn't where even, was that? Uh, that? That's right in front of the 40 watt. Oh, that's great. Um, that's and, awesome. and, uh, it, but what, what I was realizing from going through all of this material that was just generously like landed at my feet, I, I started to go back to my knowledge and gatekeepers and wanting to kind of like ferret out stuff. Um, 
instead of like hearing, oh, there was a flyer for this or there was a, a flyer, it, it's like, oh, I wanted to see it because I was, I was getting tired of kind of like what you were, like this kind of like bias that people had about the past. And I was like, well, until I see the flyer, I'm gonna hold off judgment. So um, during the pandemic, uh, I was uh, uh, spending time like many of us do uh, smoking weed. And uh, <laughs> she's a nurse, she, she knows. Uh, so, but uh, I, I was taking the time during the pandemic to really reassess myself and who I was. I had just gone through a divorce and uh, my, my dear friend, Will and Kelly Hart, who are back there, uh, I was inspired by their splash guard at their house and I asked Will and Kelly if I could rip that off. So I just decided to do painting. I'm, we're, I'm, we're going somewhere with this. This isn't about the painting. Uh, but then uh, go to the next one, Steph. Let's see what the next one is. Uh, so I, I did the plus one thing. Go to the next one. I think that's... So one of the art projects that I wanted to do during the pandemic was... I, I'm part owner of a rock club in, in Atlanta called 529, and uh, I wanted to take my new skill set and do it on the outside of the building to which everybody there demurred, but they said, you can do the green room. And if anybody's been to a green room, it is, it is where graffiti goes to die. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, wouldn't it be fun to put Georgia history in kind of like an art context in the dressing room? And so the entire dressing room, it goes the whole way around and it's all, I mean, the room cost me like $20 to do in paper. Uh, oh, and staples. Um, but you know, it's like you can see, like, uh, like so if you can imagine, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm just grabbing, I'm grabbing this stuff, I'm grabbing this stuff off of YouTube and uh, you know, like uh, Facebook and uh, you know, but because of my work with Pylon, I knew how to, and I, I mean the term in a polite sense, I knew how to doctor the, the, the substandard images to make them work. And while I am doing it, while I'm back, I mean, it's like, I did all of this without one single flyer handed to me. I just did this all off the internet. And while I'm doing it, my brain starts going. It, it's churning and it's like going, you need to do a book you need to do a book of this. And so, th th this is a year ago. This isn't like, you know, the ancient past. Like, I just did this. Yeah. And, and it, it's like, I, I, you know, like to bring up what you said about Vic, uh, I, I all love and respect to Vic Chestnut. I, I, I'm tired of all my friends dying for, for reasonable or unreasonable reasons, like Bill Doss, uh, you know, Jerry, uh, like Ted Hafer, uh, there, there's many examples, Jerry Fuchs. And I wanted to get it, I wanted to nail it out of respect to them. I wanted to nail it. And so I just started, apropos of nothing, just saying, well, I'm gonna just go do this. So I did, I, I just did it. So let, what's the next image? Steph? Uh, th this, th this is probably what I would call a case study in the best flyer ever made, except the, the, the version that they used uh, did not have pylon at the top. All it had was fry, uh, but it, it is like, it, it says everything you need to know about, uh, an, uh, sorry? Oh yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, one of the most brutally economic flyers of all time. It has three letters and you have to figure out the rest. <laughs> what else we got, Steph? Uh, this is Love Tractor from the book. Uh, this, like, uh, a lot of these uh, did not age well. Um, like, they, they, they were like colored and like just manhandled, but uh, many of these did not come from the band. 
I, I was going to clean. I, I won't step around it. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I drink a lot of water. Um, so uh, this flyer is a particular note because it's like what I was saying earlier about the, uh, uh, you know, you, you read about the flyer, but nobody had ever shown me this flyer, which is all about guys wearing dresses in Athens. And Linda Hopper drew that. And it, like, again, this is the stuff I've just been stumbling upon. Is there anything else? I promise I had a really good presentation. I'll do it, I'll do it some other time. Uh, th this is, uh, that's from Paul Thomas. Uh, oh, so uh, it, uh, here I am at the Allman Brothers archive um, in, in Macon. Uh, the, the guy who runs the place, like I, I was, I, I started this very genuinely and very plainly and in very short order, like a, a lot of doors have opened up. I remember being upstairs, that's the, the top of the, the big house in, in Macon where the Allman Brothers famously became famous. Uh, and I'm in the, the inner sanctum and I'm, I just say to the guy, I say, um, how many people have you led up here? Like civilians? And he says, I can count them on one hand. And, and so I, it is because of that. It's because of my friends dying. It's because of my work with Pylon. It's because of the painting I've been doing. I'm just kind of done sitting around picking my butt. And I'm, I'm going to just do this. How, how did you decide which flyers to put in the Athens Oh, book? it was... Uh, so, again, like, when I started the project, I, I mean, I was a lot of parts were spinning around in my head and I was like going, okay, the thing I wanted to avoid was favoritism. Number one thing. So no, in the Athens book, that I, like I was making the rules up as I went. I said, nobody is mentioned more than three times in the book. Nobody. And that includes REM. That includes the B-52s. Nobody's mentioned more than three times. I originally had the Bs only in the book once. And then there, you know, Keith, he, he said, um, why is there only one B-52 flyer? And, and so I was like, well, I mean, so, um, but, you know, like, I didn't want my own personal biases to inform the project. And as somebody who has been a fan of this music, I didn't want to, I didn't want to bore people with the same I've already seen. And so everything, like I want, it's like when I did the pylon, but when I worked on the pylon box, I wanted every page when you turned it over to be like, I've never seen that. I mean, to, to, to the people who were there, they go, oh yeah, but it, it's, it, some of this stuff was like holding on to like a, a, an image of a shadow. You know, it, it's like, it, it's, it, was, it was crazy. When you moved, uh, so, so I mean, my my sense of Athens before I came to Athens was that there's obviously some a lot of people with a really great graphic design sense here because you're seeing the records come out. Um, and when I moved here, I met Chris Bilheimer, um, who's. But before that, and you were seeing the records and feeling and touching the records. When you came here, were you already a graphic designer? No, Did you I didn't here? even know what graphic design was. So like, how, I mean, that I was just happened? a music dork. I didn't know. I I just was like, I guess you just go to Kinko's and figure it out. And and it it was not. It was not uh, the, the only time that being a designer came into my field of vision is when I lost my job at the University of Georgia and I had to figure out what the hell I was going to do. And it was 1996. So, you know, I had spent enough time behind Chris Bilheimer's shoulder having him design things for me. I was like, I can do that. I can do that. Where do I get the money to, buy, to do this? So it's like I, I sold a bunch of records and sat myself down and taught myself in my mom's house in York, Pennsylvania in the winter of 96. And then I moved to Atlanta. What? Um, Plain and simple. Uh, but, but I wanted to make a living. And being a graphic designer in 1996, I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, I could make $75 an hour at ad agencies. Who? <laughs> That, well, and, and well, especially when my rent was two hundred dollars in Grant Park. Thank you very much. What was your um, look, looking back? Who who's influencing you as a graphic designer? Chris Billheimer. 
it, yeah. it, Chris Bilheimer was my number one influence. Well, uh, ha, ha, talk about Chris a little bit. Uh, so um, I, I, some of you know who he is. Many of you don't. He was REM's art director, still is like the artist in residence, but now he is the creative director at the Alamo Draft House. Chris is, uh, if he was here, he would not like me talking about him. He's one of those kind of guys, but his knowledge and understanding of art and his a ability to meld it with a computer interface, it was effortless. And I just remember thinking to myself, if I could do anything even a tenth as good as him. And uh, we've worked a lot, but he was, I mean, it, like right there above where Cookies and Company was. And I would just go up and sit there and just pensively just watch him behind him and go, how'd you do that? Like it, it, it's it, like it was a, it, it felt like alchemy in a way, because this is, I mean, it's like we kind of take graphic design as a, 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 a given, but at that time it was, it, it, what the, I mean, I had my MBA. I was living, at, like I was sofa surfing, you know? It's like, so I didn't know what, what I was doing. It seems like the, the graphic design culture that kind of came with, uh, with, along with punk rock, I guess you have to look back like the 60s and, you know, the, the hypnosis and all this kind of mm -hmm. really interesting graphic design from the 60s. But particularly, you know, in the last 40, 50 years, a lot of what we think of now as sophisticated graphic design was stuff that's being worked out in poster art and album art of like I've, the 70s I've, and 80s. I really believe the best designs can be done with nothing. And I, it, it's like when people, especially in my line of work, talk about like what kind of computer they have. It's like, man, it, it's, that's kind of like looking at the Mona Lisa and talking about what kind of brushes they use. It's like, yeah, it's like, I mean, you gotta use brushes. You know, it, it, it's like being a dilettante about beer. You know, it's like, it's beer. It's like, I mean, it, well, it's like, I mean, because beer culture, it's like, you know, I've, I'm from Amish country, all right? And it's like, beer is beer, all right? It's like, I don't understand this whole thing about like beer, like you have to make beer a thing. It's like, how about pancakes? Let's make pancakes a thing. It's like, I'm not into this beer. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, design, uh, have, we, have we gone through all the images? You're, I, you're, you're ready to start looking at what you have done in the last, like what you have found since Atlanta came out. Okay, do you have that stuff? Yeah. Okay, so um, th this is, uh, uh, I, I will try my absolute damnedest not to get like super fanboy, but uh, I am obsessed with Limbo District. And that was Jeremy Ayer's band that started in, in Athens in 1981. It was a band for two years, literally two years. And this was a show that uh, it's silk screened. It was silk screened by Bill Georgia and Watt King. Uh, the, 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 this is the grit, 199 and a half Prince Avenue. This is the grit. Uh, and this is printed 82, 82. I haven't dated it, but you know, anybody can date stuff. Um, but yeah. That was called the Coffee Club? No, the Coffee Club was, uh, no. Uh, The co I thought the coffee club was the 1111 coffee club where the Caledonia is currently. Yeah, well, there were two different, you go. <laughs> she knows. The, the nerdy I know because I went there. Yeah. And uh, this was downstairs. Um, the grit, where the grit is downstairs is where the coffee club was. Yeah. And it opened at 1111. And upstairs was a big loft. And that's where they had to play. That's what why it's one ninety nine and a half. Yeah. Because I went to it. I was exactly. actually in the, a couple of wrapped up performances. But it, it, finding this stuff has been a a, a challenge, but a delight. Uh, because where, there have been, where are you finding it? Uh, like this came from Watt King. Uh, he, like, you know, God bless Vanessa, God, bu God bless Claire Butler, God bless the people that, you know, like have been connecting me with people because he sent me two tubes of stuff and all of it is just like, I mean, I'm not keeping it, but I, I, you know. I have to ask a question about the digging because yeah. you, in the book, I think you, no, it was in the book or in our conversation, you talk about 
two things that are the greatest enemy to someone like you who's looking now across Georgia for, um, for yeah. what, hot, what, hot, hot water heaters <laughs> and uh, partners that say, when do you even get rid of that? <laughs> and and if, if, if I had a dollar for every time I heard, because there would be people who'd say, man, I collected every flyer. Then I uh, put the big box right next to the hot water heater, and guess what went out? You know, and, and so uh, it, it, it's uh, it, it has been a, a a challenge, but a challenge that I am I'm down for, and especially when I have people like Vanessa like backing me up when I go and call people, I, I feel like I'm I'm in rarefied air, and so I don't want to mess it up, and so that's why I'm doing it. it it's like I'm just. So um, th this is, uh, I think this is 67. Uh, I've been spending, this, this is down in Macon. Macon? Columbus. Columbus, Columbus, I'm sorry. Uh, because uh, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I, when I started work on this Georgia book, I just said, well, I'm gonna have to go and dig. And so I've just been going to libraries all over the state. And that, like the, the, that, that choppiness at the top, that was just clumsy Photoshop work. Before we move on from this picture, like yeah. this is, I think I saw this one on Facebook, because you, your, your Facebook right now is just, it's just amazing. I, I, try to, I try to tease people on, on social media. I don't like well, giving them that. Well, can I, so, so, so Henry is like, he's done these two books, but now he's like off on this much bigger, uh, like he's, 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 yeah, I'm doing Georgia and Alabama. And, and so, you know, I, like to me, what's so interesting about it is like you're, you're really getting into a place here where to, to me, this, this particular advertisement says so much about the really messy, complicated yeah. uh, history of this part of the world. Uh, it's Big Johnny Reb who's basically hyping the electric prunes. And so like bringing things back to, to Grace for a minute, in the 80s, I remember reading this brief in the newspaper somewhere, it might have been the Times, about these frat guys at UVA who'd been busted for like selling all these psychedelic mushrooms or something like that. And, and by the time The Grateful Dead was having kind of its second or third great wave when I was in high school, it was like a lot of really right wing kind of like fraternity people who were really into The Grateful Dead and it never quite jived. And I guess just sometimes like things just don't jive in, in the messy way we live our lives. And so like here's big Johnny Reb, the beach if it's sixty seven or sixty eight, the Beach Boys are starting to kind of float way out into yeah, but outer Brian space, Wilson right? Was nowhere to be <laughs> right, right, okay. But yeah. but but there, there, there's Johnny big Johnny Reb who's who's um, putting on a show with the electric prunes. Well, and so well, like there's um, like I'm, I'm going to try and give like the encapsulated version. But uh, is, is anybody familiar with the Chitlin Circuit? Uh, okay, so the Chitlin Circuit, uh, numbers racket, organized crime, thugs, they primarily put on shows for black people. It, it's, it's, it, it's the empirical truth. It's the segregated side? It's the segregated side. And, and uh, I was given one of the greatest compliments ever by a, a doctor over at Emory. I say doctor because he is a, I mean, I'm just a bozo with like a, a scanner. I show him, I show him Chitlin Circuit flyers. He said during his entire research, he never so much as heard of one. The one I showed him, the one I showed him was of Bessie Smith performing for it's here. Oh, it is here? Yeah. There's the one uh, from her, her performing at the Douglas Theater in 1923 for a white audience. And that was just in the Macon, that was at the Macon Library. That's, a, that's because the Douglas Theater was, was they, they didn't um, invite white audiences to the Douglas Theater. Correct, it, it, is a, it is a black theater. So the fact that you are seeing a, an ad for white folk, they, they were sending a message and it, it's, Again, it's another thing for us to hear about it, but then when you see this in black and white at the Macon Library, I, I feel like I, I, I just have to keep going for it. It's so, like there's just so much good material out there. So Henry, like the, the best editor I've had at the New York Times so far um, it would always say this thing where I talk to him like in this really manic caffeinated way about a thing I was researching. 
and he would just say, keep going, click, and then you'd hang up. And like, to me, this is so, like, it's, it, you, yeah, like, it, you have, you, like, the way, and the, what I find fascinating about where you are right now is like, it's okay, all right, we're gonna talk about the scene, and we've talked about the limits of kind of what we think of as the Athens scene, 70s, sure. 90s, whatever. And, and it's, you know, this, this describing this very kind of discreet, you know, kind of smallish thing. Tell us about the thing you found it was a show for Sherman's troops, right? Okay. okay. So it's here. Oh, you have it's that? Here. Okay. Oh my God. So um, th this was over at Special Collections. Uh, something everybody should know about me, I'm a huge military history nerd. So uh, I'm going to get up just so I can stretch my legs. But you can see this. Some somebody wrote on here the date. This is the week before Sherman marches to the sea. The, they, the, it, the, the the, the, arm, the Northern Army had been camped out in Atlanta for three months. They do, a sh if anybody's familiar with Atlanta, this is roughly where the Athen or, uh, uh, Fox Brothers is on DeKalb Ave. They do a show, November 5th, the, uh, where, where is it on here? The 33rd Massachusetts Volunteer Brass Band was going around the South on train and doing like pop-up shows. Pop-up shows during the war, okay? I, I heard from, about the show that the, the doorman was a total dick. Uh, yeah, the doorman. <laughs> 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 Keep going. Uh, but but this was, this was a, a benefit for an officer uh, who had died for his widow and they raised, what was it, $20? $200. $200. Uh, but it, like this is, like I, I'm, I'm going to take a brief moment to give the ultimate shout out to Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie's my girlfriend, but uh, she's also she's also uh, completely able to ferret out like a lot of like that I don't like dealing with, like going on databases or all of this crap. And so I, I just say, okay, I give her some buzzwords. And I just walked into Special Collections, and lo and behold, it was in a in a folder. The you know it's crazy. It's it's crazy. This is called being a historian. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and really, for Grace's benefit, I want to add, and I'm sorry to interject here. There were we have since this is an event called the Cobbler's Frolic. And there were two additional versions of this broadside. There's One another was version. Painted on a, a pole. There is a photograph. I think this is November 5th, 1864, and it's painted over on the side of a building in Cabbage Town, but someone took that photograph. There's only a couple people it could have been. And there is another printed version that is slightly different that we have seen a scan of. So this is one of this the, in the most ephemeral of ways, and this survives the burning. There, there were three different versions of this exact same poster. And, and so, it, like, I, I'm, I am perpetually, we are perpetually rewarded by just making the most casual of, you know, like, what? It's like a morning at, at special collections. You can flip through stuff. Uh, this is one I like. That, th this is, uh, does anybody know who Dick Gregory is? Yes, sir. Okay, so th Dick Gregory, our, our man. Uh, this is a show that he did in Atlanta in 1966, and uh, the balls that it took to put that on a flyer in Atlanta, Georgia in 1966, big shout out to Dick Gregory. That, that's going to be in the Georgia book. That's, that, that's going to be in the, that, it, it's like, <laughs> it, it's one of the most powerful flyers I've ever seen. That's a, that's a really powerful photo. It, it's powerful as hell, yeah. Oh, in case you can't read it, it says, Klansman at Crystal, Saturday, January 18th. Like, the, the week prior to this show. That's yeah. incredible. Show us some... What else? What, what else is there? there? Oh, there, there's a great one. Oh, yeah, yeah this is here in Athens. Um, that, that's, uh, that's from the Red and Black. Yeah. Uh, it, but yeah, it's like uh, the brown beetles from the Royal Peacock in Atlanta. Oh You're my gosh. Do you know anything about the brown beetles? Uh, they the were the, the drifters? Was that it? The drifters? Yeah, it, it was, but they, it was very common for uh, <laughs> uh, these guys to don beetles' wigs and just, you know, go through the beetles' sort of catalog kind of thing, you know, bob their head. Uh, 
before I get too far ahead of myself, uh, th this this is great, but um, one thing that we have found, and I like I will share information with anybody, uh, is is the uh, the materials that I have found from the Royal Peacock in Atlanta from the 50s and 60s, you know, because it, it had like a punk rock resurgence in the 80s. But I want, I want this room to think about Georgia's canon of musical history. Th just think of, think Little Richard, think James Brown, think Otis Redding. I have listings of every last one of them at clubs. Henry, I got a question. Like, like, like there's the Lithonia Country Club. The Lithonia Country Club was a black owned club in Lithonia that was not a country club, it was just a club in the country. <laughs> and, 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 like and Speedway. Yeah, and, and they, had, they had a Speedway. But there's little, I mean, this is like Little Richard, James Brown, like performing, and, and it's just, like I remember when Stephanie and I were at the, the, the public library, and we would like, we, you know, it's like we found some rock in 1935. Like we're we're finding the, the stuff we're finding is only limited by what our knowledge is, and so it, it, it's it's been invigorating and exciting. But I, again, literally, I I just started. You know, well, so. One of the things uh, that I thought about when when you started telling me about this much bigger, broader project was the difference between. Georgia and Texas. The Texas I, I lived in was was born there. Texas is like famously self mythologizing, and in fact, it's, it's, I went to school at, at the University of Texas, and when I got there in 1988, there was already a, I mean, Austin's a bigger town, but there was already this kind of infrastructure of self mythification. So like, you just had people who'd been around, you know, when LSD came there, and Rocky Rocky Erickson and the 13th floor elevators were there, and like, it was. Um, they were already writing about themselves, and, but then they were reaching out. They were already defining what Texas music was. Well, it's this, it's Doug Sam, it's, it's also Norteño music, it's also the Cocaine Cowboys, it's also, you know, you know it's, it's Bob Wills, and, it, and, and, it's, and it's punk rock, and blah, 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 blah. Well, but, but Georgia, I feel like it was a little bit, it doesn't, hasn't really gone it, it, through this process. It's never way. been given its due. And uh, like, it's one thing to have respectfully, books done, but it's another thing to uh, kind of own it because I cannot believe like how, uh, like, uh, like Little Richard, for instance. I mean, a gay guy in Macon, Georgia in 1954. Do you really think the city of Macon was all about Little Richard in 1954. I didn't know his, no. his his band was called the Upsetters before the upsetters. Lee Perry, right? Yeah. That's pretty amazing. It, the Upsetters. The Upsetters. Yeah. Little Richard. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's. Uh, it, I, I'm going to go back to one thing you said, and I think it bears repeating. Um, the, one of the reasons I did these books was because I was so frustrated with national books about music and and Georgia as somebody who you know is kind of like a, a, a I got here 30 years ago I just got here um, I, I was always just really dissatisfied with how Georgia was reflected in if the South was mentioned it might be something like corrosion of conformity but it's like I mean it's like if you what do you want to talk punk rock what about neon Christ what about Neon Christ? What about, you know, like, what about the antiheroes? Like, what about, like, there's like, what about, what about, what about, what about? And, and so then I, I just thought to myself, do the book. I'll just do it because it's like, I know the knowledge and I'm not going to pander to somebody else. I'm going to just do it. That's, that's literally because of Chunklet, because of Athens, because of my, my love of this city. I was like, well, I think my friends would check me if I was off base. And so I just started doing it. The, I mean, I think for, in, with both of these projects, what I find so fascinating is like, you think it's a thing about something very small and, you know, yeah. about this post postage stamp sized patch of earth as, you know, Faulkner used to describe his, the, the, the county that was basically the area around Oxford. 
but you keep digging and digging and digging, and then the themes get very, very big. And I, I think Grace, that was one of the things I found really great about your book, is as someone who, again, was like kind of a tourist here in this, in this place and was, saw it close up, hadn't really seen anyone think um, and really see all of the, the really big themes that emerge from just looking very, very carefully, you know, from sitting down, talking to people um, in this rather small city. And then I think the same thing has happened with this project you have, where I'm gonna figure out like how people told people there was a show going on, which seems to me, like you think, okay, that's a very narrow thing and it's of interest to graphic designers, um, you know, people who are real nerds for, for music. But it actually, I mean, seeing like big Johnny Reb uh, try to seeing it pitch the strawberry larger. alarm clock is like, 60s in the South, like it really is like an amazing. Well, well and and again, as somebody like when I did the Atlanta book, everybody and their mother was like being very cautious about like get it right and all of this, and I was like, like I'm I'm literally showing the, a piece of paper, like I'm not doing the work. I, it's like so. Um, oh my here, God. Here's uh, I'm I'm gonna bring this story up because. Uh, I think it's funny. Um, so uh, uh, 688 was a famous club in Atlanta uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Famously, Iggy Pop, when the, the club, you went to a couple of the shows, didn't you? Yeah. Uh, it, 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 like, did a teen night. Iggy Pop did a teen night on a, on a, mon on a Monday. So, um, so, so for the Atlanta book, I was aggressively looking for this flyer. It's amazing, and you look at it and you go, wow, it's offset printed. You know, it's like two colors. I bet you you could find it. I couldn't find one to save my life. I could not find this flyer to save my life. I call the guy who used to book the club. Apropos of nothing, he didn't know me. I didn't know him. And so I call him up and uh, he says, yeah, I have the flyer. And I was like, great. Great, oh my God, that's awesome. And he's like, yeah, but you're gonna have to pay me. And I was like, not a problem. I've never paid for a flyer, but I really wanted this. And I was like, Wh whatever it is, it's not a problem. And he said, 25 bucks, Venmo. I was like, done. And I hang up, I text him my, tele my, my address, and uh, he says, uh, what's a, what's a, what, what a, I, I'm not mailing you this poster. And uh, I was like, well, I, I, I need to scan it. And he said, no, that ain't happening. And I said, well, um, so he said, I'll just text you a photo of it. And I said, can I text you a photo of 25 bucks? <laughs> Steve May. Uh, so um, whatever, I don't, I'm not, I'm not being catty. It's his story is exactly the same. Uh, but but uh, th this th this is part of a larger story because Iggy was at the most cocainiest of his I just made that word up of of his life and Steve May was like one of the big you know far farmers alleged farmers of it anyway but that that was how he famously got paid they had the set list painted on the wall Hey honey how was uh, Teen Night. Uh, <laughs> well, mama, I watched a guy cut his torso off and ride it. Oh, anyway, is. so um, th this is th this is just shows you the beauty of like just stumbling into places. Uh, I was in Douglasville, Georgia, uh, and I just went in and started looking around. And I, this really nice old woman, like walks me around, and she's showing me this exhibit that they're gonna be doing. One of the guys, th this, this shows you how you can never tell what you're gonna find when you're gonna find this. This is from 1966, Jerry Lee Lewis performing in Fort Payne, Alabama. And I know you're thinking to yourself, it's like, oh, the band Alabama is from Fort Payne. Funny, this flyer came from one of the guys in Alabama who dropped off his piano and this flyer to this Douglasville Museum. And uh, it, like, it, 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 like, I mean, th th this is kind of, I mean, again, this is like canon stuff. This, this is not Henry Owings's like war on what's cool and what's not. I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis is like, you know, like one of, one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And here he is like doing a show in Fort Payne, Alabama. And, and so it's, it's everywhere. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm ha we're having, 
I think we're having a good time. I think we're, as long as we can get a good margarita along the way, we're usually having a good time. Dude, I'm gonna have one right after this. <laughs> oh, there you go, Heather. Uh, Stephanie wanted, like, I, th this always gets weird. So I'm a graphic designer, I'm a show promoter. I used to book a club in Atlanta called the Echo Lounge. That is a flyer I designed for a show I put on with the Olivia Turner Control in, in Atlanta in 1998. And uh, that, that's it behind glass. And where, would you please explain the flyer and where it is now? Oh, uh, the, the, that's a flyer from my collection that's at Special Collections. Um, and uh, I, I gave them a few truckloads of stuff. And uh, there's more coming. And there's, so. yeah. Is that in the current? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, this one I love. That's, a, that's, that's the only, correct me if I'm wrong, that's the only flyer that you were allowed to design for. Well, I designed a few, but that's like one of the only ones you were allowed to be in your book. <laughs> So, so, so two, two things. Uh, first off, the Pylon brand was spot on from day one. That flyer was it, like, I could, I could almost, I, I, it's an amazing flyer and it's hard for you to see, but it's like kids in underoos and they're opening up for the, for the talking heads and the bees at the Agora Ballroom in 1979. And uh, yeah, but it's like absolutely one of my favorite flyers in the world. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, she did it, she did it. <laughs> Guys, we're at, we're at five o'clock. Do you wanna do? You, uh, I was told that we can go until 5.30. Do you wanna go? Yeah, we can, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I, like, uh, I, but I wanna point out, is this in the current exhibit correct. at Target Library? It's yeah. actually December. And it's called Georgia on my mind, and it's not just uh, the new way for the new music here. It's like all genres of music. They have country, it's everything. and western, country and western. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's a, a flyer for a show I put on right down the street at Cusar in 1996. Uh, there's a flyer from 529. There's that pylon one. Of, uh, that Cindy's dress from the bees. Oh wow! Uh, it, to have my my stuff amidst the, those, got, you know, the legends. You know, it's like I'll, I'll take it. I'll take That's it. Awesome. Uh, so should we open it up to questions? Because it's like I mean, we can, or I mean, we can just. Oh yeah. What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you came up here. <laughs> this is so cool. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm the arts and culture reporter at Online Athens and the Banner Herald. They gave me that job right when the COVID started. So <laughs> I've been, I've been, I was gonna say I've been learning as I go. Oh, I think he's gonna handle the microphone. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Grace, the book is awesome, and I love that you've addressed race and privilege uh, here, even maybe more so than in the book just today. Um, my area of interest is researching the uh, Athens hip-hop history, and so I was wondering if, since we've got such a great group of journalists here and art artists as well that have been through the whole thing, if, is there anything that you can say about the hip hop scene and why we don't know more about it. My research has been pretty difficult. A lot of the people you mentioned at the library and stuff, they just don't have the materials. And at the exhibit there that's current, currently there now at the Russell, um, when I did the story on it, there's this big blank space. There was no Athens hip hop memorabilia at all. As a, as a matter of fact, I had to get them in touch with some of the local hip hop historians to put it in there. I just want to hear anything, any insight, anything at all. I, I mean, I, I, I could talk about this all day, but I'm not going to do that. So. Well, I, I would love for you to talk about it because there wasn't much of a hip hop scene when I was here and the, my book ends in 91. Same. So so I don't have a lot of knowledge of it, but I do know, um, you know, there are local historians for sure. What was the guy's name we were on the panel with? Bill that, right here. Yeah. 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 Okay. But, but one thing I did want to say is there's also a professor you, you should get in touch with, Derek Aldrich at the University of Virginia, but he used to live here and he, he was a big fan and he documented the 
early scene. And he's not, you know what I mean, he doesn't live here anymore and he's not, not that's not his work. He's an ed professor for his job, but you should talk to him because he knows a lot about this. So um, it, it's not Athens hip hop and so I'm sorry it's not Athens based, but right down 316 is Atlanta. And I think that we can all fairly safely say that one of Atlanta's greatest hit exports other than Coca-Cola and Delta Airlines is hip hop. Hard stop. Delta's Monroe, Louisiana. Monroe, it is from Monroe, Louisiana, but, it, but it's based in Atlanta. Well, that's for another time, Will. I, I knew it's from Monroe. <laughs> Enough of you. <laughs> I, 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 like, uh, but, So, uh, so, uh, so, um, I, I, I have digitized myself 16,000 pieces. The amount of hip hop is, if it's not zero, it's borderline zero. And I've, meaning I've done the work, it doesn't exist. It, it, yeah, uh, however, however, in, in light of that, I am about ready, I mean, you guys are getting a big scoop here. Uh, you paying attention? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just playing, Vanessa. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, one of, one uh, uh, gentleman, I went to his house to look through his collection and he, he was kind of like what I would call like the Ian Mackay of Atlanta hip hop. Like he was like doing it, but like on a scale of, of 10, like in other words, you know, like whereas a big indie release is selling 500, he'd sell 5,000. You get what I'm saying? He pulled out eight freezer bags filled to the rim with snapshot photographs of name the Atlanta hip hop artist. I, I mean, go obscure. I, I, I've seen it all. One woman took photos of everything because she had a side hustle where she was selling photos to whatever, Alt Weekly needed a photo of whatever. Eight freezer bags of Atlanta hip hop history is just waiting to be published. And uh, it, it, it's, it's just like, I, I can't speak to Athens hip hop. Personally, I've put, on, I've put on a few shows. There's not much hip hop, but it, it, the great stuff always flourishes in the shadows, always. And so I love being wrong and it, you know, it's like, I'd love to see what there is, but it ain't much. But, but you know, my understanding is there was very much a scene going on in house parties, you know, starting in the 90s, yeah. and they couldn't get booked in any of the clubs. No, so I mean, there's got to be stuff. There's got to be pictures. There's got to yeah. be tapes. There's got to be, Anything you know, I memorabilia, you photographs. Like it's like, it, it, it's not as easy to find as you would think. Well, and one of the things that we found through this project was that promotion of hip hop shows was done very differently. I think Richard alluded to earlier. Um, proliferation of like the punk DIY movement and there's a very specific intersection that happens with the copier and I know Vanessa and Bob can speak to that very distinctly um, of the, the copier and the DIY movement because the Xerox and Vincent in like 59 and so by the early 70s it's, it's becoming ubiquitous. Um, Hip hop doesn't promote its shows in the same way. They don't do flyers that they're putting up on kiosks. They, it's, it's just promoted differently. And by the time you start to see printed materials, advertising shows, these are much larger acts that have moved outside of their region. They're coming in from New York. They are- Again, it turns into a scale thing where it's like, you kind of go, yeah, there's no, they didn't do house parties, but uh, you might find like a, a slick postcard or something, but it's, it is just not it, like I mean, I, like I re clearly remember when Outkast, Ludacris, all of them were starting because I mean you, you saw them everywhere, but I, I can't say that I have seen one flyer. But I got photos. You I, just I like what Vanessa said about having enough people to support the scene. 
Yeah. You know, and them all coming to each other's shows and things like that. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I brought, I bought your friend's book while I was there. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> Thank you. Good. Yeah. Good Did question. Does anybody else have any uh, questions? All right, gang. No. Cool. Can I go home? To go to the bar. I'm yeah. Ready. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, please come up with your corrections um, if you live through it. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the library for, for having us. And, and, and buy a book if you haven't already. Thanks.